Lady Liberty's Holiday, written by Jen Arena, illustrated by Matt Hunt. Not long before the 4th of July, Lady Liberty woke up feeling a little blue, despite being green. Year after year, she stood by New York Harbor, a torch in one hand, a tablet in the other. Mo, every day feels the same, Liberty said. I see the same skyscrapers, the same city. My neck is stiff. My arms are aching. I've had a cramp in my leg for a decade at least. Mo puffed out his pigeon chest. Lady, you need a getaway, he told her. Go and see the country. Shake the rust off and I don't have any rust. Lady Liberty protested. Mo went on, give yourself a holiday. Mo's words echoed in Liberty's head. She had only seen one little corner of America. What was the rest like? That night, she lowered her torch. She put down her tablet. She pried her sandals from the stone. And then the Statue of Liberty snuck away. First, she left footprints on the Jersey Shore and built the biggest sandcastle Cape Cod had ever seen. She washed the sand off at Niagara Falls. Then Lady Liberty headed west. She watched the Mississippi River from the top of the St. Louis Arch, and in Kansas, wheat fields tickled her feet. She even did some sightseeing in South Dakota. She hiked across the Rocky Mountains in sandals. Afterward, the California sunshine made her so sleepy, she napped on the Golden Gate Bridge. Back in New York, Mo was starting to worry. The 4th of July was three days away, but without Lady Liberty, People weren't in a holiday mood. Tourists were gloomy. Cops were cross. Even the stock market was down. The mayor was talking about canceling the 4th of July. What if Liberty doesn't come back in time, Mo said. What if she's gone for good? He had to find her. It was true. Liberty wasn't thinking of returning. At the Grand Canyon, for once in her life, Lady Liberty felt small. She trekked through a hot, dry desert and slurped water from a Yellowstone geyser. It tasted awful. Deep in the heart of Texas, she napped under the big bright stars with cattle all around. She danced to music near New Orleans, used the Florida Keys as stepping stones, and waded through southern swamps. Lady Liberty was shaking an alligator off her big toe when she heard the familiar flap of pigeon wings. It was Mo. He perched on her shoulder. Lady, I've been looking all over for you, he said. You have? Liberty asked. How are things in New York? Not so good, Mo said. They're canceling the 4th of July. Liberty bolted up as if she'd been struck by lightning. Canceling the 4th of July? They can't. Mo nodded. Nobody feels like celebrating without you. But the 4th of July isn't about me. It's about America, Liberty cried. I've seen this country, the Purple Mountains, the shining seas, the bridges and buildings. Everyone should know how amazing it is and celebrate it. Mo fluffed his feathers. Come back to New York, he said. The mayor might change his mind. He didn't get to finish. Liberty was already running north. At dawn, the sun shone on the copper dress of Lady Liberty in New York Harbor, where she had stood for over a hundred years. That night, fireworks lit the sky, and people waved flags, 
sang songs, and shouted, Happy Fourth of July! And Liberty was blue no longer. It was good to get away, she told Mo, but it's great to be home. Lady Liberty's Story The Statue of Liberty is as American as apple pie, but her story begins in France. In 1865, a sculptor named Frederick Auguste Bartholdi went to a dinner at the home of Edward René de La Boulay. La Boulay was a big admirer of America. At the time, France was ruled by Emperor Napoleon III. America, on the other hand, wasn't governed by an emperor or a king, but by elected representatives. Laboulet hoped someday his country would have a similar system of government. But in other ways, he felt America and France were already alike. After all, both countries believed in liberty and equality. After that dinner, Laboulet proposed building a monument to bring the two countries closer together. This suggestion stayed with Bartoli. He even had an idea for the monument, a large statue of a woman holding up a light. Laboulet and Bartoli wanted the statue to be ready for America's centennial in 1876, but they missed that date by a decade. It was a complicated project. For one thing, Bartoli and Laboulet had to raise money to pay for the statue. From the beginning, they pictured the monument as a gift from the French people to the American people. France would pay for the statue, America would pay for the base. Bartoli traveled to America, but he had trouble getting people interested. Even after the statue was finished in Paris, dismantled bolt by bolt and copper sheet by copper sheet, packed into 214 crates and shipped across the ocean in May 1885, America still hadn't raised the money to build the base. That was when Joseph Pulitzer, the publisher of a popular newspaper called The World, got involved. He promised to print the name of everyone who gave money, any amount, no matter how small, in his newspaper. School children sent in pennies. Rich men sent in much more, and eventually over $100,000 was raised. Building the statue was very complicated, too. Bartoli started with a plaster mold only four and a half feet tall. He scaled that up several times to reach the statue's final height of 151 feet and one inch. After making wooden molds in the shape of the statue, workers hammered thin copper sheets only three thirty seconds of an inch around the molds and then riveted them together on an iron framework. Meanwhile, Gustav Eiffel, the same man who built the Eiffel Tower, designed a metal skeleton to support Bartoli's hollow statue in even the worst weather. On his first trip to America, Bartoli found the perfect spot for the Statue of Liberty, Bedloe's Island, at the entrance to New York Harbor. While the statue had started as a way to highlight a friendship between two countries, over time she stood for much more. Because of where she was placed, she became a symbol of freedom to immigrants arriving in America. To many of them, Lady Liberty represented the new life they would have there. In 1903, a poem by Emma Lazarus was added to the pedestal to honor the immigrants. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free are its most famous lines. The Statue of Liberty was unveiled on October 28, 1886. A huge parade marched down Fifth Avenue to the tip of Manhattan. Bands played both the French and American national anthems. Even Grover Cleveland, the President of the United States, came to welcome Lady Liberty. When Bartoli pulled a rope to remove the French flag covering the statue's copper face, America got its first glimpse of Lady Liberty and Lady Liberty got her first glimpse of America. Secrets of the Statue of Liberty Some people say Bartoli based Liberty's face on his mother's. 
Liberty's arm was displayed in America for six years. During part of that time, her head was shown in Paris. Liberty looks green now, but when she was built, her copper skin was the color of a new penny. As the copper weathered, it changed color, getting what is called a patina. By around 1915, the statue was completely green. Liberty has seven spikes on her crown, one for each of the seven continents or seven seas. Bedloe's Island was renamed Liberty Island in 1956 after its famous monument. By the time the statue was unveiled, Laboulet had passed away. He died in 1883. Visitors can climb a staircase inside the Statue of Liberty to her crown. There's a secret entrance to the Statue of Liberty in her right foot. That's how the workers entered the statue during construction. Lady Liberty's nose is four feet six inches long. Liberty's tablet says July 4th, 1776. Lightning strikes the Statue of Liberty hundreds of times every year. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Twitter at Toyrific Entertainment.